Hi family, thank you for joining us online today. It is our honor to be able to come to your homes, your office, or wherever you may be watching us here today. When you are able, we would love for you to come and join us physically in our Sunday celebration. We meet Sundays, 3.30 p.m. at 55 Devere Drive, Guelph, Ontario. We hope today's message will encourage you in your walk with the Lord, build you up in your faith, and empower you to live the victorious life that Jesus Christ paid for on the cross. Here's today's message. Good afternoon, champions from Guelph, Cambridge, Brantford, Kitchener, or wherever you are in, in Canada, um, in our community. Thank you for joining us online, and we want to encourage you, if you haven't, share this link or, and start a watch party and invite your friends and family to join us right now. Before we start um, today's message, I would like to begin in a different approach. And as you all know, um, we have already surpassed a million cases all over the world with this coronavirus. It is a sobering time. It is an, we're living in an unprecedented time. And more than 50,000 lives have been taken by this virus. It's like we're in a war zone. In fact, 58,000 lives were taken in the Vietnam War. And so it's like we're in a war zone fighting an invisible enemy. But I know that even in the midst of all these, God is seated on his throne and he's fully in control. But at the same time, church, even as people of faith, and we rejoice with all the answered prayers of all the recoveries around the world, we also want as a people of God to obey the command that's in the word of God that says to rejoice with those who rejoice and to mourn with those who mourn. Paul the apostle said to the Roman church, rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. Even Jesus, who is the resurrection and the life, when he heard of Lazarus' death, when he visited the tomb of Lazarus, he took a time to weep. And so I want to start with a moment of silence and just lifting up those families, 50 plus thousand lives. They're not just numbers, they're lives. They're someone's spouse, they're someone's child, they're someone's grandmother, they're someone's teacher, coworker, neighbor, friend. And as the world is heartbroken, it does not mean we have lost our faith if we also feel the brokenness. Because even though Jesus is seated upon his throne, he is close to those who are brokenhearted. That is what the psalmist said. And so let's just take a time to pray right now. Father, we lift up to you all the families that have been impacted through a death of a loved one with this coronavirus, Lord. We just ask for your presence to be so tangible in their midst right now. That you would comfort them in their sorrow. And that, Lord, you would make yourself so real to them that they would know that you have not forsaken them and that you are walking with them even through this journey of grief and pain, that you are walking with them every step of the way. And so, Lord, we lift them up to you, and we ask that you would comfort them, Holy Spirit, even right now. And we continue to pray those who are in critical condition and those who have been uh, diagnosed, who have tested positive, we, we speak a word of healing to manifest upon their bodies. And we ask that you would raise them up from their bed of affliction. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, today I want us to talk about so a sobering message. You know, as I had mentioned earlier, we live in sobering times that require sobering conversations. There are difficult questions going on around right now. There are many questions that are waiting to be answered. 
and it's sobering. It's not a time to party. It's not a time to, well, we can't party because, you know, social distancing. But more than ever, in our generation, this, I believe, is the most sobering time to actually examine ourselves and ask questions that we probably have not bothered to ask or did not dare to ask when, before all these shutdowns and before, all the, before this pandemic. I, wanna, I want us to open our Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse 27. Jesus said to the disciples, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. I have a question for you today, friend. And as you are seated right now in the comfort of your homes, I want to speak to you as if I'm with you right now in your living room or in your, in your, wherever you are in, in, in the, your most comfortable area in your space right now. Just as if we are one on one. And I just want to ask you, how peaceful is your peace today? I find this conversation that we read in the passage of John 14, 27, I find it very interesting, friend, because as you know, these are the final words of Jesus, part of his final words to his disciples. And in the context of this passage is that Jesus is about to be betrayed. He's about to get arrested, brought to trial. He's about to go through a grueling, painful, brutal process on his way to Calvary. And yet, although it was not the disciples heading in that direction, Jesus was the one heading in that direction. And in his darkest hour, he tells his disciples, peace, I leave we with you. I mean, if there's anyone in that scene who needed peace, it would have been Jesus. And yet in his darkest hour, in a moment when he knew he was about to go through a very painful process, that in the Garden of Gethsemane, he even begged and asked the Father to take the cup away from him. He knew what he was about to face, and yet he was full of peace that he was still able to say, I'm giving you. You can't give if you're not full of something. And, he's, and Jesus says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. And it's very interesting because, I, you know, if you read that passage and if you think that he was giving his, his disciples the peace right at that moment, then everything else would have been different. They would not have fled when Jesus was arrested. They would not have hidden. They would not have been hiding while Jesus was in the tomb if they received that peace right there in that moment. And so we are going to unpack this passage. What is this peace that Jesus was talking about with his disciples when he said, peace I, I leave with you. My peace. He, he clarified that it's not a peace that that you are imagining right now, by the way, Peter, James, and John. It's not the peace when I say to you, I'm, I'm giving you peace. It's not, it's not the peace that you are so familiar with, that you, are, you, have, you have grown up to be taught what this peace looks like. It's a different kind of peace. And I do not give the way the world gives. And we're going to unpack that right now. And I'll do that with a story from when we were young. I, I, younger, and as, as you all, as many of you know, I grew up in the Philippines, and as a, as a young girl growing up in the Philippines, um, I remember we were always so fascinated with beauty pageants, and in the 90s, uh, you know, even to this day, there's a lot of beauty pageants, especially in the Philippines, it's like every opportunity you can have a beauty pageant, they'll throw a beauty pageant, and it's almost like every young girl is prepped up to be a candidate of a beauty pageant, and, and we were so fascinated with it. But in the 90s, there, you know, there was also this trend of world peace. This whole, uh, these, these logos of, of peace like this, and, and, and just, and maybe in the early 90s, that was a huge trend because it was also the time when the Iron Curtain was just broken, the Cold War had just ended, the Berlin Wall had been destroyed, and now 
everyone is hoping that finally there will be world peace. And I remember after school, we would pretend to be in a beauty pageant, my friends and I, and we would always get to the most exciting part, which is the question and answer portion. And my friend would pretend to be the host and I would pretend to be the candidate. And she would say, if you become Miss Universe, what do you want the world to be? And I would just confidently say, world peace. I want world peace. You see, church, the idea of peace is not unique or is not, uh, is, is not a unique invention that, was, that came up through great philosophers. The idea of peace did not start with Buddha's idea of nirvana. You know, this whole idea of peace has always been inherent in the hearts of man. Every man and woman, young and old, had always been pursuing peace within their hearts. You know, the Hindu's goal to be united with Brahma is not a unique concept. It is an interpretation of man's desire for peace. There's always that desire for peace. Uh, some of us, we may call it happiness. Some of us may call it fulfillment. But where is this concept coming from? And I want to propose to you today, church, that you and I, as the Bible has said, we're made in the image of God. And God, throughout scriptures, God is called Jehovah Shalom, referred to as God of peace, my peace. I am the Lord of peace, Jehovah Shalom. Jesus, who the writer of Hebrews says is the exact representation of the Father, is called Prince of Peace. And I want you to know, church, that the reason why every man and woman has this deep desire for peace in their heart is because we were created in the image of God who is the God of peace. We were designed to live with that peace inside of us. That drive, you know, that constant hunger in us where we feel like we need to have more success, more achievements, more accumulation, more possession, more approval, more recognition, that, that desire that drives us to seek for more. And on the flip side of that, that drive that causes us to be, feel so tormented when we fall short of our pursuit, that drive, if you strip that down, is actually the desire for peace. For many years, a lot of us, for many years, for ages, men and women have satisfied themselves. We have satisfied ourselves with the way the world offers peace. We grew up being inundated with the idea that on our own efforts, this is achievable. We were taught that with our own striving, that we'd, if, if we work harder at it, if we pursue harder, we would achieve peace. We would find that fulfillment. And from ages, the whole human history is, a, is an accumulation, is a collection of stories of how men and women have invented different ways to get that peace. More so now today, in our generation, more ideas are coming up, more, more gadgets, more entertainment, more sports, more. Why? Because that hunger has not been fulfilled. From indifference to escapism, to escapism, to to apathy, to indulgence, whatever, we, whatever is offered to us that promises this sense of fulfillment. Sometimes we, we just numb ourselves and say, I've stopped caring just so that I don't have to feel that desire for peace. But there is that desire. It's in your heart. And nowadays, especially now that we're facing this global pandemic, this global crisis, you know, the, the surging need for peace is becoming more evident, equal, if not more than, the need for medical supplies and healthcare equipment. This is our message to you today, church, because 
that pursuit, that seeking, that search was actually addressed on Calvary. You see, Jesus' words rings loudly in our ears today. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. His words imply that the peace he is offering is different from the peace that we are so familiar with. His words imply that the way he gives it is different from the way the world gives it. What is this Christ's peace? What is Christ's peace? First of all, Christ's peace begins on Calvary Hill. Began in Calvary. The peace that Jesus was talking about was given to us in a place that you and I may not think would be our favorite hangout. Peace that Christ was talking about did not come in a comfortable place. It was not birthed and released and given in a place of convenience. It was not birthed in a place of perfection. And this is good news, friend. It's good news because if you've lived long enough, you've been to Calvary. Whether it's a painful rejection, a broken relationship, a termination in your job that you feel you, feel you deserved, a layoff, a mounting, uh, mounting debts that you can't pay, Wh whatever situation that feels so painful and so overwhelming and sometimes brutally tormenting, it's Calvary. And the good news is that the peace of Christ was released in Calvary. And so if you're finding yourself in that situation right now, you are so close to the peace of Christ. You see, sin, the act of falling short of God's perfect standard, was the root of our endless desire for peace. Sin took away our peace. Sin stole our peace. Peace in the passage we read is the Greek word erene, in the Hebrew word shalom, which means to be tied together into wholeness. And so whatever has been broken has lost peace because peace means to be whole. And when Adam and Eve decided in the Garden of Eden that they can become their own God and they did not need God, sin began to enter into man's heart. And the relationship with God, which was the primary foundation of our existence, we woke up when man became a living being. He woke up to a relationship with God. When that relationship was broken, peace was broken. Peace left the moment that relationship was broken. And that sin has been transmitted from generation to generation, kind of similar to the virus we're facing right now, where we can't even trace how it really gets transmitted, but it gets transmitted anyway, and it keeps destroying lives. It keeps threatening lives. That is a picture of sin, church. We have been under a great spiritual pandemic for, for ages until Calvary. Sin and peace cannot coexist. Whenever there is sin, there is a conflict, and that conflict is felt first in the heart. Whenever we sin against someone, it breaks relationship. And when something is broken, something is not whole. That's why there's no peace. Whenever we fall short of our character, we feel inadequate. We feel that sense of inadequacy. And that is a picture of brokenness, not whole. That's why there's no peace. But praise be to God that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You see, church, before we could ever get to that peace of Christ, we must first be willing to face the truth that, yes, 
I, I do not have that peace right now because of sin in my life. The truth is we were slaves to sin. Paul the apostle said there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who seeks God. He further says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And that's why in our own efforts, we could not find peace. Isaiah puts it this way. Jesus paid what we could not pay. He was pierced for our transgressions. Isaiah 53. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we were healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid upon Jesus the iniquity of us all. Family, none of us, none of our good works can ever compensate for our sins. None of our good works will ever be good enough to bring in that peace. The Bible says that our own righteous acts are like filthy rags before him. Our best intentions are still muddled with pride. Our humblest act of service is still tainted with selfish ambition. We are desperately hopeless without the Son of God, the Prince of Peace, who came and took our place, took our punishment, so that sin can be done away with. Sin could not be removed from man until the punishment that was due sin was provided. Paul the Apostle wrote in Colossians 2.14, he canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. And that, my friend, is the reason why there is peace to those who put their faith in Jesus. Because now the charges against you and me, the barrier of sin that has separated us, that has brought isolation, isolation, causes a lot of anxiety, depression, a feeling of helplessness, a feeling of limitation and restriction and bondage, and that isolation is not new just with this COVID virus. That isolation came when the virus of sin came upon man, and that sin that set us up isolated from God was removed when Jesus took our place upon the cross. That is the reason, church, why we can walk through the valley of the shadow of death with confidence. We, we might feel the shadow of death. We might see death. We might even, some of us, God forbid, but there is a day where we will face death, but we can face it without fear. Why? Because that barrier between us and God has been removed. We are never alone, even in death alone that is a piece of christ in his letter to the corinthian church paul the apostle paul paul the apostle says for god was in christ reconciling the world to himself no longer counting people's sins against them and he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation that my friend is the peace of christ this is what jesus meant when he said my peace i give to you our reconciliation with god is the breeding ground for our faith and our hope that cannot be overcome because if he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for all of us, the Bible says, will he not also graciously give us all things, whether here on earth or there in heaven? The peace of Christ is this knowledge that if I live, I live under the goodness of God because I stand blameless before him through the work of Christ on the cross. If I die, I get to be in the presence of God, where in the presence of God there is fullness of joy, and on his right hand are pleasures forevermore. That is the peace that comes from Christ, church. If I die, I get to be with him. If I live, I get to taste his goodness. That is the peace of Christ. 
The peace of Christ made Paul declare in any and every circumstance, whether in abundance or need, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength because I am no longer standing guilty. I have been proven worthy, not because I've been good enough, but because Jesus went to the cross and paid the price for me. He proved my worth through his death and sacrifice peace of christ caused the disciples to praise in their shackles caused them to preach the gospel to their own jailers caused the a, a fearful peter who denied jesus to become a brave evangelist that brought three thousand men unto salvation the peace of christ made stephen smile even while he was being stoned this peace of christ is foolish to those who refuse to to believe and refuse to have it but to those who who have been at their lowest bottom to those who have been at the foot of the cross this peace of christ makes so much so much met, means so much more than what they've ever hoped for or ever imagined. The peace of Christ causes us and empowers us to mourn with hope, to believe that our grief can be turned into rejoicing. It enables us to rest and trust in the sovereignty of God when our most difficult questions remain unanswered. That is the peace of Christ. When our expectations about this pandemic are not being met immediately at the time we are praying for, at the time we're hoping for, the peace of Christ empowers you to trust in God's goodness and sovereignty. What is this peace of Christ? that Jesus took our place. How does he give it? He gave it by paying the price. How does he give it? How do we receive it? How then should we respond to the gift of peace he has given up on the cross? One, we must repent. Repentance is not an emotion. Repentance is simply a change of mind. We must change our mind. We must change our mind and stop thinking that our good works can give us that peace. We must change our mind and stop believing that we are good enough, that we don't need a savior to have that peace, that I am talented enough to come up with something to have that peace. We must repent from our wicked ways. We must repent from that sin. We must repent from sin that, that brings us to bondage that, that, does, that hinders us from receiving peace. Repent. We're not supposed to stay in repentance. We're supposed to change our mind and believe. We're not supposed to stay acknowledging that we have sinned. We're supposed to acknowledge our sin and then give it to Jesus. And then surrender. The second step is surrender. We must surrender our lordship over our lives to the lordship of Jesus. Change your mind and then surrender. Surrender your steering wheel to Jesus. Give up, give up your control over your life to Jesus. Let him direct your paths. Let him teach you his ways. Let him rearrange your life. Let him rearrange your lifestyle. Let him reorder your attitude. Let him put in place his order upon your heart. Repent and surrender. And so today, church, family, I want to ask you, how peaceful is your peace? Is it the peace that is so dependent on your circumstance? Is it the peace that is so dependent on your ability to achieve something? Is it the peace that's so tied to your strength? When in the moment of weakness, you find yourself not having that same peace, I want you to know, my friend, the good news is that you are so near to the cross right now. It's not an accident that you're watching this message. 
And you might have been coming to church regularly. You might have grown up in Sunday school. You might have been part of the worship. You might be part of the worship team. You might be part of a Bible study group. I don't know where you are right now, but I want to encourage you today to examine yourself. How peaceful is your peace? Are you right with God? I want you to know, church, that this is a very critical message for you to hear. This might be the only opportunity you'll ever hear this message. And now is the time to make a decision to get right with God and receive the peace that comes from Christ. I want to invite you right now to pray this prayer with me. Father, I have sinned and I have fallen short of your standards, your standard of perfection. I acknowledge my sin today. I acknowledge that I am a sinner in need of forgiveness, in need of your peace. I have tried so hard to find that peace on my own. I have searched everywhere, tried so many things to fill that void that's longing for peace. I have tried to make sure every question I have should be answered, thinking that that is the way to peace. But Lord, today I come to the foot of the cross and I just give my life to you. I surrender. I surrender all the sins I have committed. I surrender all my own expectations. I surrender my lordship today to you, Jesus. And I receive the forgiveness of sin. I, I receive your forgiveness. I receive your mercy. I understand, Lord, that because of love, justice had to be met. And you sent your son, Jesus, to meet perfect justice because that is love. That you could only be merciful if you are righteous. And so you've sent your righteous son. And you've dared to give your one and only begotten son to go and pay for a debt I could not pay. To become sin so that I can become righteous. And I receive your mercy today. I understand I don't earn it. I don't deserve it. It is your gift. And I receive it right now. I thank you, Father, for this peace. In the name of Jesus, I praise you, Father. Amen and amen. Friend, I want you to know that if you pray that prayer with sincerity in your heart, the Bible says that to those who believe him, he has given them the right to become children of God. Children not born out of the will of man. Children not born of the flesh, but born of the spirit of God. You have made a very important decision today. It doesn't mean that all your questions will be answered. It doesn't mean that, that, that all the things that you are hoping for will immediately come to pass. One way or another, no matter what happens, in abundance or in need, in triumph or in trial, you have the peace of Christ. And you can stand strong, not in your strength, but in the perfect love of the Father. God bless you. Thank you so much for joining us online today. If this message has impacted you or has blessed you in any way, would you consider sharing it on your social media platforms? Perhaps God will use this same word to touch and bless your friends and your family's lives. And if you haven't, we encourage you to like us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel, all under Champion Life Center Guelph. By doing so, you get to stay updated with all our activities and the latest messages. Connect with us. We have online forms found in the description box below this video. We would love to hear from you 
And if there's any way we can serve you or pray for you, that would be a great way to do it. If you also wish to partner with us in what God is doing through Champion Life Center Guelph, click on the link found in the description box and you will see various ways of partnering with our ministry. Until we see each other again, God bless you, go with God as God goes with you.